you know that sound. It is the closing bell at the New York Stock Exchange. A mixed close of the day for the U.S. stock market. Dow Jones climbed about 100 points. The Nasdaq ended the day down about three quarters of a percent. The S&P dropped about one quarter of a percent. Joining us now in Studio 57 are Javier David and Kristen Myers. Javier is a CBS News contributor and a managing editor for Business and Markets for Axios. Kristen is a business reporter. Welcome to you both, TGIF. Javier, let's start <laughs> with this number that's out today. The Producer Price Index report shows uh, that prices rose 0.3% from last month and 0.8% from a year ago. So what should we make of that? Give us some context. Is that a spike? Is that something that people were expecting, or is this unexpected? Mm. It's, uh, yes. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. The best way to describe it is this is a, what we're calling sort of the summer of disinflation. Now, disinflation mm -hmm. is different from deflation. Like, disinflation means the rate of inflation is slowing, but prices are still rising. Uh, this wholesale number was kind of consistent with sort of a rebound that we've seen overall in the economy and prices, uh, some of it attributable to the surge in uh, gas and energy prices. We're getting, um, seeing a little bit of pressure, upward pressure there that um, is kind of concerning. Uh, but by and large, we're seeing a moderate pace of inflation or a moderating pace of inflation. Um, and these numbers are pretty much consistent with that. Nothing to be panicked about, but don't be surprised if the Fed hikes again in September. All right, so uh, that's the PPI report, but this came out right after the Consumer Price Index mm -hmm. report. Kristen, that was, I was describing it all day yesterday as a mixed bag. What do you right. make of it? So we did see inflation tick upward, right? Kind of what we were seeing with the PPI or wholesale inflation. But it didn't go as high, essentially, as economists had been anticipating. They were expecting a 3.3% year-over-year increase. We saw that come in at 3.2%. Now, a little bit about what Javier was talking with that upward um, price pressure when it comes to things like energy. We saw shelter coming in at higher. So that really put this upward pressure for the inflation in that CPI report. And so we saw gas prices particularly kind of drop quite a bit in the spring and they've been ticking upward lately. And so that's why we saw a little bit of that pop in that CPI report. But again, as Javier is mentioning, this is this is disinflation. So we still are seeing inflation, but we have to remember we were up over 9% in June um, of last year. So we really come down a, a pretty far way. And, and the, I think the remaining question really remains is, it's largely expected, right, that the Fed is going to pause rate hikes, at least for the remainder of the year. But are they seeing the kind of disinflation or deflation that they want to see to really continue that, that rate hike pause going forward? And then what if I could just jump in right really quickly. It shows, kind of shows you that the fight against inflation is not a straight line. Like mm -hmm. This is why mm -hmm. you've seen the Federal Reserve people have said, well, why don't you kind of like bump the brakes? Why don't you stop? Why don't you pause? This is the reason why. It's very difficult once inflation, when you let the genie out of the bottle, it's really difficult to kind of recork it again. And this is why. It just shows you kind of the waxing and waning of demand in the economy. And you see these sort of temporary spikes. It's not temporary. Nothing to sort of overreact to. But just kind of shows you how difficult it is to corral inflation once it's kind of been unleashed. Yeah, more like an art than a science. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, it sounds like. Um, all right, let's switch gears, Javier. We're following some breaking news. So a judge has revoked FTX founder Sam Bankman frieds bail and sent him to jail. What's your reaction to that? And remind us again of, um, you know, what exactly uh, the charges were against him. So this is um, a fascinating case. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of old school old-fashioned financial fraud mm -hmm. combined with uh, a very hot, once was hot, sector in cryptocurrency. Uh, Sam Bankman-Fried was one of the biggest personalities, if not the biggest, in cryptocurrency. Um, he was kind of seen as this modern-day uh, James Pierpont Morgan figure. He was going out, spending lots of money, um, bailing out troubled crypto institutions until we all found out that uh, a lot of this was sort of smoke and mirrors at best. Uh, so I've been pretty fascinated with uh, his sort of strategy, such as it is. He's been doing a lot of talking. This is a guy who's in a lot of trouble, a lot of legal hot water. Um, his parents, his house is mortgaged in order to keep him out of jail. Uh, but he just keeps talking. And it's like, say, why do you... strategy, yeah, Javier? And, and I don't know. Yeah, but just I, again, I'm just... I, point, I really right? find myself extremely mystified. He's always out in the media. He's always continuing to sort of defend. I think he really is deeply invested in this narrative of him being 
this beneficial benefactor, great guy who just screwed it up and got and kind of got in over his skis. But this is fraud. Like he is accused yeah. of a lot of different mm -hmm. things and he could go to jail for a while. Well, and Kristen, feel free to weigh in on Sam Bankman Freed, but also feel free to weigh in on the larger uh, landscape of cryptocurrency, right. the PayPal news right. this week. So, I mean, I think crypto, I mean, and it still continues to be, right, this really, like, hot market. Everyone really wanted to get into it. But then we started to hear all of these headlines, right, FTX is one, where it just seems like there was a lot of scams going on, or, you know, as Javier put it, just good old-fashioned fraud, right? Just what we typically hear of when we hear about essentially securities fraud or any kind of financial scam. And I think that that has really pumped the brakes, I think, one, on interest uh, quite a bit on, on getting involved in cryptocurrency. But then we also saw the regulatory sector starting to take notice and say, okay, well, we really need to start getting involved. And I say that, but we still haven't seen okay. regulation. Because here's the problem. A lot of politicians don't understand cryptocurrency. Yeah. Mm. And if you've ever listened to any of their hearings, it becomes pretty Evident, right. they have no idea really how it works, how they're going to create some kind of regulation, what a regulatory authority really should have kind of control over that sector, um, and really how to give teeth to some of these regulatory authorities to really make sure that we can protect anyone that is deciding to invest in these kinds of assets. And it sort of bears mentioning that these sorts of shenanigans don't help, they kind of lead to uh, an environment where regulators are more prone to overreach mm. than they are mm. to do anything else. Uh, the fact that a lot of investors have been burned, um, the, the whole thing with uh, FTX is there's billions of dollars somewhere. Most of it is, probably doesn't exist or never even existed in the first place, but there are investors that had money invested that may never be made whole again. Right. Can't imagine being Sam Bankman Fried's attorney or, or his, his parents. team of attorneys or his parents. Um, anyway, to be continued on that front. Um, so, Javier, earlier this week, ESPN struck a $2 billion sports betting deal with Penn Entertainment. I'm wondering, this is interesting because you have ESPN, right? This is a, a, a sports broadcasting entity. Now going into this foray, into the sports sort of gambling world. Mm. Talk to us about that sort of intersection here. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. ESPN is kind of trying to execute its own pivot in a way. Um, they've offloaded a lot of costs, uh, primarily some of their on-air talent, um, in order to, to pull this off. Um, the parent company, Disney, has been struggling for a while. There's a lot of talk about whether they're going to try and extricate themselves from linear television altogether. Maybe they'll sell off ESPN. Who knows? Um, but all of these things, is, there's a big booming market for people that want to gamble on sports. Um, and we saw elements of this even before sports betting was legal again. Uh, people like fantasy football, there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of money to be had. Um, and it sort of raises the question because ESPN is at its core a broadcasting operation. Right. So it's like us, like we're sitting here, yes, mm -hmm. does CBS have a gambling arm? It's no, but, <laughs> and it makes it very difficult. It raises a lot of questions about conflicts of interest right. and putting so forth. Right, putting your thumb on the scale. Putting and your how, thumb how on the scale. And athletes. how are you reporting on And how are you reporting on that? Yeah. At the and, time and when so, bets are being made. Yeah, so they've got a really fine line to walk in all of this. But the bottom line here is that it's a lot of money, and uh, they want a piece of it. All right, Kristen, we only have a couple of moments left. Uh -huh. Would you rather talk about ESPN betting, or you want to talk about I'm, Taylor Swift? I'm all about <laughs> Taylornomics. Okay, let's Swift talk about this, because she's not performing <laughs> in the U.S. again until mid-October. Right. Era's tour made so much right. money, actually played a role in the right. U.S. economy. Yeah, the, Phil the Philadelphia Fed actually gave her a shout-out, shout out. actually, <laughs> and said that, you know, because all the Swifties, I think that's what they're called, Swifties, right. yeah. yeah, absolutely bought out every single hotel room, that it actually saw an upswell to the Philadelphia economy. I mean, L.A. got over $300 million when her tour stopped there. We've seen other cities experience this massive boom, and they're actually sailing, saying that Taylor Swift's tour is going to be bringing in over a billion dollars in ticket sales. That's going to be a record. I saw even one analysis say that the economic impact, at least on the U.S. economy, could be as high as five billion dollars because those Swifties are going out. They're buying hotel rooms. They're going to restaurants. They're buying merch. They're stopping in at nearby bars and restaurants, and they are spend, spend, spend. And I mean, even on the way here, I was uh, passing a store right here by Columbus Circle, and Taylor Swift, right? Mm. And there was 
tons of, of young women inside just buying up all of the shirts and T-shirts and clothes and everything like that. And that has a huge knock-on effect to the U.S. economy. I'm interested to see how Beyonce's tour is going to do. I, 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 I have to mention. I was just about to say that. I, really I want to see how yes. the Beyonce tour is going to impact oh. the U.S. economy. Similar, if not though. identical, Absolutely. dynamic. Right. Like people Absolutely. are just going out of their way Absolutely. to buy up Beyonce stuff. Buy special outfits. It's like a whole uh, thing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But more people right. left the country to go to Beyonce. Yes. Yeah, because it's cheaper. Yes. It's cheaper, cheaper overseas. So, I mean, it is absolutely fascinating just to see how much fans love these artists and are going to spend money and how the U.S. economy benefits. All right, we got to leave it there. Javier David, Christian Myers, thank you both. And still to come on Money Watch this week, mortgage rates just crossed 7%. That is the highest they've been since 2002. We'll take a look at the ramifications. And credit card balances have tipped the $1 trillion mark. We're going to show you how one woman is trying to tackle thousands of dollars in debt while traveling the world. Well, it is a difficult time to be a home buyer in the U.S. The 30-year mortgage rate crossed over 7% in early August. That's according to new data from the Mortgage Bankers Association. It's the highest level since 2002, and rates are not expected to drop anytime soon. CBS Money Watch Associate Managing Editor Amy Peakey joins us now. Hey there, Amy. So how much is this historic rise in mortgage rates affecting the real estate market? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a fascinating time right now in the real estate market because you have a couple different trends going on. One is you have rates that are more than double what they were just a few years ago in the pandemic. And secondly, you've got this squeeze on inventory. Um, the problem is that you have folks who bought their homes or refinanced their homes a couple years ago when rates were 3%. And now looking at the rates as 7% and higher, they don't want to move. You know, they're kind of locked into their homes, even though they maybe, you know, if rates were a lot lower, they would want to move, but they just feel locked in by their rates. So it really is impacting the market in that it's putting kind of like a freeze on the real estate market. Um, so, you know, that lack of inventory is really hurting the market. It's also driving prices up higher, which is kind of hard to believe. So you get this double whammy of higher mortgage rates plus higher home prices. And, and it's really hard, as you say, to be a home buyer right now. Yeah, double whammy indeed. So where do you expect this might go? Is this the peak or could mortgage rates keep climbing? Well, you know, it is really hard to say, but I think key is what happens with the Federal Reserve. I mean, one reason why the rates are so high right now is because we've had a year and a half of the Federal Reserve increasing uh, the federal funds rate and mortgage rates are responding to that. So I think what's key is, you know, what happens later in the year. There is some um, expectations from economists that the Fed will pause on the rate hikes, but a lot of that depends on inflation information. So there's no guarantee. Um, and then, of course, what will really make them come down is if the Fed cuts rates. But that depends a lot on the economy, and nobody really sees that happening anytime in the near term. So, you know, I think the best thing that we're hearing from economists is that perhaps rates will go down a little bit later in the year, but you're probably not going to get back to any near where those low pandemic rates of 3% in, in the near term. So, Amy, I want to pick up on something that you said, which is that people are having to spend more, not only because of the mortgage rates, but also because the cost of the homes have actually increased. How does this affect their ability when they're trying to get loans and they're asking for more? Is it more difficult to actually get those loans? Are the purse strings tightening up? It is, actually. There's data out there that shows that banks are actually being more strict about who gets a loan. So they're looking for a higher income and they're looking for better credit scores. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was looking back at the average home price in 2002, the last time that rates were this high. The average home price back in 2002 was about $230,000. Now it's almost $500,000. So, you know, home prices have, have more than doubled since then. And, you know, rates are back at that same level. So, you know, to support that kind of home, banks want to see that your, in your income can, can support it um, with those higher rates. So, yes, it is getting harder. Banks are looking for more uh, credit worthiness from, from borrowers when they apply. Average home price is doubling, but salaries have not in that time frame. All right, Amy Peakey, thank you. Thank you. Americans' combined credit card balances have escalated to record high numbers. CBS News' Bradley Blackburn introduces us to one woman currently working toward becoming debt-free. This morning I drank the free coffee that they had at my house. 
Jamie Feldman is currently traveling Europe on a budget. She's also on a debt journey that she regularly shares with her TikTok followers. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm in $9,400 of credit card debt. I started to get responses from people who either had advice or were in the same exact boat. The New York Federal Reserve says for the first time ever, Americans' combined credit card balances topped $1 trillion, rising $45 billion in the second quarter. It's really a story about high inflation, high interest rates. Bankrate.com senior industry analyst Ted Rossman says the New York Fed's numbers reflect total balances, including the 53 percent of cardholders who pay in full every month. The other 47 percent carry debt. That 47 percent with debt is up from 39 percent two years ago. So unfortunately, we're moving in the wrong direction there. A recent bank rate report found 54 million Americans have been carrying credit card debt for at least a year, showing it's pretty easy to get in and a lot harder to get out. I think the best way to lower your rate and shorten the term is to get a zero percent balance transfer card. Debt holders can also look for a reputable nonprofit credit counseling agency or sell items they no longer need. For Jamie Feldman. I have the automatic payments of $95 a month, and then I try to throw a couple hundred more uh, here and there when I can. Steady progress toward her goal of being debt-free by next summer. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, New York. Still to come on Money Watch this week, the UK economy grew faster than expected in the second quarter. What it means for the Bank of England's ongoing battle with inflation. You're streaming CBS News. The United Kingdom's economy recorded surprise growth between April and June. The new GDP numbers come as the country continues to deal with high inflation. UK's economy saw 0.2% growth in the second quarter, according to the Office for National Statistics. That's being driven by increases in spending and manufacturing. Scott Wren joins us now. He is a senior global market strategist for Wells Fargo Investment Institute. It's good to be with you again, Scott. So tell us, what does this increase in GDP in the UK say about the state of the economy there right now? I, well, I tell you, really, uh, you know, 0.2 percent is not much growth. Certainly, that's what we would consider uh, very, very slow here in the U.S. But for uh, for the Bank of England and for the U.K. economy, uh, it means that the Bank of England is not finished hiking rates. Uh, you mentioned that the U.K. has very high inflation. Let's call it 8 percent. 7.9 percent was the reading uh, last time. Uh, their target, like the Federal Reserve, uh, is really near 2 percent. So uh, inflation has a long long way to come down. It's a lot higher than it is here in the States. And so I think it's safe to say that uh, manufacturing, construction, consumer spending in the UK is all way stronger than what the Bank of England would like to see. So there's more rate hikes coming. Well, Scott, how are markets responding to the UK's GDP growth? Well, I, I think that if you look on a global basis, um, you know, the Eurozone economy as a whole, uh, not doing very well, basically probably in recession right now. Uh, the UK economy probably headed toward, um, um, you know, a moderate recession at the very least. So I think money has tended to flow still to the U.S., uh, if you look at most equity valuations, while the FTSE 100 index uh, really is pretty flat on the year, which is better than um, uh, of many indices uh, ar around um, the globe, uh, still, uh, we do not think that um, whether it's European equities in general or the UK stock market is really a great place to invest right now. So we would step back from that. Hey, Scott, last time we were talking about the United States and uh, and the Fed's approach to fighting inflation here and the UK and the banks uh, trying to do the same over there and some of the differences, given uh, that the UK is still dealing with really high prices and some of the additional struggles that they've had there. And as you're saying, even though these GDP numbers are surprising, they're still pretty small. What, what does all of that say in terms of of uh, the UK's fight against inflation and where you see things going? Well, I think the Bank of England has to basically decide, are we going to cause a recession to get inflation down? And I think they'll make the, the decision that they do. And so uh, we're likely to see 
Um, you know, certainly at the next Bank of England meeting, another 50 basis point rise. And you could probably argue that uh, we'll see another 50 basis point rise the next couple of meetings. So uh, they cannot in any way, shape or be or, or, uh, any way, shape or form be happy with inflation, consumer inflation uh, that is anywhere close to where it is right now. It needs to be uh, several percent lower before they would even start to find some sort of a comfort level. So uh, the UK is in a very tough spot. It's going to probably take a recession. I think you can safely say that it's going to take a recession. The Bank of England is going to ha have to hike rates high enough to cause a recession to reduce demand and get inflation down. Those managers probably really jealous hearing all of our talk of soft landings yeah, here in the U.S. Absolutely. Scott Wren. Scott, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, guys. The sad truth is that summer is winding down and we are heading into fall, which means it's time to begin tackling that back to school shopping list. That's right. This year, parents are expected to shell out a record amount of money on supplies. CBS's Haley Ott shows us some ways to save. Oh, you need a hard plastic pencil box. Parents are checking those supply lists twice. Right there, those lunch boxes. As they plan to spend a record amount on back to school shopping. The National Retail Federation says families with students in elementary to high school are expected to fork over $890. Those with college kids, a record $1,366 per student. One reason for the increase, about a third of shoppers are buying big ticket items like computers and phones. New data show prices for smartphones are actually down 17.6% from last year, and books and other educational supplies are down 3%. Children's footwear is also cheaper. Being able to find it on sale is always going to be a, a good thing. Samantha Gordon from Consumer Reports says many retailers are offering deals, so compare prices. More than a dozen states offer summer sales tax holidays, which add to the savings. Having two to shop for since things have went up over the last couple of years, and the sales tax, that's going to help out a lot. Experts say while one-stop shopping is tempting, it's important to take your time and be methodical. If you're really looking to save money, the best strategy is to spread out your shopping over time and over different retailers. And time's not up when the school bell rings. You can ask teachers which items are going to be needed right away and what you might be able to hold off on until the later months. Advice that could help shoppers. I try to penny pinch whatever I can. Stretch every dollar. Haley Ott, CBS News, Clifton, New Jersey. Well, that does it for Money Watch this week. In the week ahead, we're going to have a closer look at the state of the U.S. housing market with the latest figures from the NAHB Housing Market Index. You're streaming CBS News, always on.